Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and as usual I'll start with an announcement. Actually, um, just one announcement, that conference is only a few weeks away so you need to be making your plans to get to Columbus on November 13th so you can spend the weekend with us and hear from New York Times best-selling authors like Dr. Kelly Turner, Radical Remission, Richard Ablin, the guy who discovered prostate the specific antigen. Uh, we have Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of an Epidemic. We have a presentation on diet and gastrointestinal disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, diet and hormones. There is so much to learn at this conference. If you're a clinician, you gotta be here and learn from these people. If you're a regular medical consumer, you need to hear what these people have to say too. Plus, we're really cool people to hang out with for a weekend, right? So why would you not wanna to come to Columbus and hang out with us? All right, let's talk about some health news. Um, this is actually kind of a big deal, I think. Two analyses reported in the British Medical Journal concluded that dietary and supplemental calcium have little effect on bone mineral density or fracture risk. According to these analyses, dietary and supplemental calcium may result in a teeny tiny 1-2% to 2 increase in bone mineral density. It's really inconsequential. In an accompanying editorial, a guy from Uppsala University in Sweden stated that both calcium and vitamin D supplementation have been aggressively promoted using guidelines from the National Osteoporosis Foundation and the International Osteoporosis Foundation. He says that these guidelines are such that almost all people over the age of 50 are considered at risk but most of them will not benefit from taking calcium or vitamin D supplements. And this is a familiar theme in the diet and health business and in the medical business, which is you keep expanding the parameters of people who are diseased. You can, if, if you try hard, you can turn every single healthy person into a damaged or sick person that needs some kind of treatment with supplements, drugs, or procedures. And that's exactly what is done on a daily basis. And unfortunately, consumers still fall for it. Both analyses were done by two um, by New Zealand researchers who looked at data from randomized control trials and observational studies that involved giving extra dietary or supplemental calcium for women and men over the age of 50. The first analysis was the one that showed that taking calcium supplements and eating more calcium in food only increases bone mineral density by 1-2% to 2 and that these small increases are not likely to result in the in, um, in reduced risk of fractures. They reported that calcium supplements, quote, probably have an unfavorable risk-benefit profile. In other words, more risk of harm than anything good happening. They also wrote that there, were some, uh, there was some evidence of publication uh, bias in small to moderate, uh, to moderate randomized controlled trials. The second analysis showed that dietary calcium is not associated with fracture risk and that there's no evidence showing that if you increase it, you're going to prevent fractures either. They concluded, quote, collectively these results suggest that clinicians, advocacy organizations, and health policymakers should not recommend increasing calcium intake for fracture prevention, either calcium supplementation or from dietary sources. And what this brought to mind is in um, whole Rethinking the Science of Nutrition, uh, Dr. Colin Campbell talks about the fact that uh, one of the fallacies of all of this supplementation, fortified foods, is the assumption that however much you take in orally, it's going to get into the system when actually the body has very tight controls to make sure that too much of nutrients don't get into the system and often has to make a lot of um, uh, adjustments in order to protect the body from getting too much into the system. So um, it, this all this nonsense needs to just stop. I have no faith that it's going to stop because disease mongering is where the money is. So again, taking all these healthy people and turning them into six patients. You're at risk of this. You're at risk of that. You're going to die from this. You're going to die from that. Unbelievable. All right. So now let's go on to something that's a little more constructive. Um, also requires change that I don't think is going to happen, but here it is. The gut microbiome controls a lot of our immune function, as many of you know. So it's not surprising that researchers recently reported that babies with low levels of four very common beneficial gut bacteria have an increased risk of asthma by the time they're a year old. What the researchers did is they took stool samples from babies at three months and they looked at their microbial makeup and identified four species and found that if, you, if the babies had low or undetectable, low or undetectable levels of these four bacteria, they were able to, um, they were highly predictive, 100% predictive of early signs of asthma and skin allergies. None of the babies with high levels of these four bacteria developed 
asthma or skin allergies at age one. Additionally, the researchers also analyzed urine samples and found that there were byproducts of these bacteria and that they were different. Uh, the urine samples were different in the kids who did and did not develop asthma. Now, in addition to studying human babies, the researchers also did an interesting experiment with animals implanting stool samples from the asthma-prone three-month-olds into the guts of, germ, of germ-free mice. The animals predictably developed um, inflamed lungs, a symptom of asthma, indicating that the absence of those four bacteria were important for animals too. When the four bacteria were added to the gastrointestinal tracts of the mice, the airway inflammation decreased. So um, where does the, where, how is the gut destruction happening? Like what happened in babies that didn't have these bacteria? Well, um, antibiotic use early in life has a lot to do with it. Method of birth, method of feeding, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but all of these things go to damage not only the, the gut bacteria in terms of quantity of bacteria, but the diversity of the bacteria as well. And according to study author Stuart Turvey, he says, quote, what I think is important and not so surprising to pediatricians is how important very early life is. And our study emphasizes that in that first 100 days, the structure of the gut microbiome seems to be very important in influencing the immune responses that cause or protect us from asthma. Okay, so if we're going to protect the gut microbiome, here are some things that need a change. Um, uh, since medical practice probably won't change them, consumers need to make these changes and make sure that they happen. So the first thing is doctors should stop over-prescribing antibiotics for every minor thing that happens to a pregnant woman just in case. Pregnant women need to say no to antibiotics except for when they are really, really warranted, which isn't so often. And the closer those antibiotics are taken to the birth date of the baby, the more likely the bacterial colonies will be skewed or absent at the time of birth. Um, so remember, moms pass on uh, bacteria to babies as they come through the birth canal, which brings me to the second issue, which is that we've got to stop doing so many C-sections in this country. We have one of the highest rates of C-sections in the entire world. And there's no question that once in a while they're beneficial for life-saving purposes, emergency purposes, but the vast majority of C-sections are not done for emergency purposes. My proposal is that every woman who pr um, uh, proposes or asks for a C-section be given a document saying, before I do your C-section, I want you to read this paper and uh, it will explain all of the terrible things that can happen to your kid as a result of C-section because your child will not get beneficial bacteria that would normally be acquired by coming through the birth canal. All right, now, so, um, antibiotics are also uh, prescribed too often during, uh, during and after labor. C-sections, almost all women get them. We need to stop that. The risk of infection is actually very low these days. And for women giving um, birth vaginally, also need to stop giving the antibiotics then. And then I mentioned feeding practices. Breast milk populates the gastrointestinal tract much better than cow's milk. Um, cow's milk really doesn't have the ability to do that. So here's the problem. Our kids are sicker, and they're getting sicker starting at younger and younger ages. I mean, you should be just a tiny bit alarmed about asthma at the age of one year old, right? Um, but it's due to the damage sustained by their microbiome as a result of common practices that I just talked about. And so the cost of making the changes is negligible. The cost of not doing it is immeasurable. Um, it's financially expensive, but the quality of life, I mean, think about a one-year-old child having asthma, all right? We gotta stop this nonsense. Cut out the antibiotics, except when they're really necessary. And, um, and of course, there are all kinds of, I could go off on a whole lot of tangents about the overuse of antibiotics, but my gosh, if you can't get motivated by anything else, how about protecting tiny little helpless babies, all right? Okay, that's all for today as usual. Pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.